So we're going to go ahead and see about fitting this yeah, on this horse. Yeah, be cool. Kind of show how everything fits. And yeah, you want the hole to run his neck or? Um, we'll just leave it for now. I'm going to tie this real quick. Yeah. Um, this, how I tie this, well, you'll see it right now, but also on YouTube. Um, when we do this, the number of wraps is going to depend on the size of the horse's head. But when we're doing this and we're tying this, this rein, I untie it every time I ride. It helps preserve both my hackamore and my makate. And when we look at tying this, most of the time it takes us longer to talk about it than it does to actually do it. Now this thing is tied and ready to ride. So uh -huh. when I'm tying these things, once you get in the practice of it, it doesn't take long. No. Um, if we don't untie it, what happens is your, um, your hackamore, your bozelle, will start to twist. And then that will give you an a uneven signal. Uh -huh. And the other thing is that it will put a kink in your rein. Like you look at all of Steve's makates, they're all hanging here with no kinks in them because they've been untied. If you leave them tied, you get this weird kink. So then if you want to lengthen your rein or shorten mm -hmm. your rein, you get this weird stuff going in the middle. Yeah. And that'll create a problem for us. Um, now, one of the things when I'm doing this, if I'm not sure that I've got everything adjusted right, um, and how many wraps I have on this, if this is the right right one for this horse or not. I usually just toss this over the neck, tie a bowline um, knot here, and now I can take put this on and take this off of this horse and make all the adjustments that I need. Okay? Right. Um, this is when the old guys in California, when they halter broke their horses, um, they, a lot of times, they would actually use the hackamore. Yeah. And then they would take the rope up under the hackamore and over the pole with like a wide um, burlap sack yeah. that spread the pressure over so that we didn't have any isolated pressure over yeah. the pole. So those horses are pretty much used to having this as the main signal for that anyway. So that's just kind of a side note. Yeah. Um, just throw that over there. So they should lead pretty well by the neck. Yeah. 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 So we definitely want a horse that's leading by the neck. Yeah, I know. I'm not as tall as Steve. I can't reach up that high. Come here, big guy. Um, looks like I have one too many wraps. Okay. So as I go to put this on, I put three wraps and then the rein, which for him looks like it's one too many. So I'm just going to yeah. take one of those off. Yeah. Um, now, the around. number of wraps that I use is, again, going to depend on the shape or the size of the horse's face in relation to the size of the hackamore. But I don't usually like more than three, which is what I just had. Um, I prefer two, which is what it looks like it's going to be on him. So when I say wraps, I'm talking about the number of times this goes around the bottom. So the way we count wraps is two wraps and then the rein, and then one on top. Um, really quickly, the other thing when we're looking at this and the signaling, you notice my reins come out as high as possible, and I have a straight line here. Yeah. There are a lot of different ways to tie this. You get on the internet and you're going to find a whole bunch yeah. of different ways. Some people have the reins coming out of the bottom. Yeah, not. people have the reins coming out of the bottom. They'll have like a whole stack of wraps and then the reins out the bottom. You lose signal. Um, also, you see people have an extra wrap around one bar here. Well, mm -hmm. what that means is every time they pick up the reins, it's going to signal the left side before the right side or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I want this flat. I want these out the top. And I usually don't like more than three wraps. Mm -hmm. If we start getting more than three, this gets too long. And especially at the canter, when you're loping and cantering, that thing will start, this heel will start to bounce because of that extra weight out here. Mm -hmm. um, where when you have this a little shorter, it just limits that. Um, so for me, two is ideal. One is okay. Um, two is, one is okay, two is ideal, and three is still okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you guys know who Sheila Varian was, she was an old California trainer that passed away here not that long ago. Um, she only wanted one rep. Yeah. She never wanted yeah. more than one. Um, she rode some really nice, very sensitive Arabian horses, and she rode a very soft hackamore with one wrap. Yeah. Gave her a very clean, very fine signal. Okay? Yeah. So... You might just bring him around to the camera, huh? Yeah, I'm going to... Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll do that with the yeah. camera. Come here, wild beast. There we go. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm just tying this back away from the eye. Mm -hmm. Okay? And there's, I mean, it doesn't matter how you tie it. I tie it this way just because it's easy. Yeah. And I tie this back, and this goes on the bone. You want to, don't want this up in the throat latch. I'll go on this side so you guys can see it over there. 
Um, I don't want this up in the throat latch here. I want this on the bone. That pulls it away from the eye, so we have no problems, okay? Take this off from around his neck. Now, what we're looking at here, and he's in perfect position to talk about this, this bozel fits him pretty well. Um, you can see we've got good contact through the face. It's not squeezing tight on his nose. It's shaped so that it opens up down here to allow that to follow the contour of the jaw. It follows the contour of the nose very well. Um, underneath the chin, it has the right amount of space under the chin. This setup right here is going to give you the maximum amount of refined signal as you pick up the, the reins. What we're looking at is a lot of these you see, especially in the modern sport world, they're big and open. And you've got this where you can see daylight under there. Well, you have two problems. One is if you have it like that, all of the pressure is in one isolated area. So that's going to start to get sore, tired. Yeah. Um, you're going to start rubbing, rubbing hair off, rub, getting, you know. Yeah. Getting they're, they're the guys that say you've got to keep moving it all the time. Yeah, they want to keep moving it all the time. And again, that's not, it's not the old style. No. Um, and that's part of why they can't keep a horse in a hackamore for very long. Um, mm -hmm. Why the horse gets dull, why the horse gets heavy. So they're going to callous the nose. They're going to callous the nose, and the horse is just going to get dull to the signals. Mm -hmm. The other problem with the big open hackamore is as you move, it starts to move on its own and give a false signal. So then the horse has a hard time sorting out yeah. your signal versus the false signal of the horse or the hackamore moving on its own. Um, yeah, I think when, you know, when I first, before I ever met you, Mine would just touch the jaw on the bottom there because it was so loose So loose. everybody had them floating around. Yeah, and that's also one of the reasons why you get a lot of people talking about how you can't get good lateral flexion in a hackamore, how the horse will turn the jaw, how they'll head, their head will twist. Yeah. Um, if your hackamore is loose and you pick up on the rein, then what's going to happen is all the signals on this side of the nose, if we picked up on the left rein, we're trying to get a left bend, the head will tip this way if it's too loose because all the pressure is on the nose bone here and the jaw bone here, and it's tilting the head this way as you're asking the horse to go that way. If this is fitted properly and I pick up that rein, as long as I don't go out wide like a lot of people do, which creates another problem mm -hmm. in the hackamore. Might be fine in a snaffle, but not in a hackamore. If I'm not going too wide and I'm giving a good signal, then what happens is the whole side of this hackamore pushes this horse's head this way the hackamore pushes the horse's head here. So as I pick up on the rein here, I get the signal through the whole face, not just up under the jaw here, okay? Yeah. So you don't want any twist at all at the pole there? No, the I, want, I want that head vertical, it comes around. Otherwise, any twist in the pole at any time is a sign of tension. So even if I've got a horse that decides to break in half and start bucking and I do a one rein stop, he's not relaxed until his head is vertical. Mm -hmm. So even if I brought him around, I've doubled him, if his head is twisted, that tells me he still has tension through his body. Mm -hmm. When his head goes vertical, then we've released the tension and we have proper bend in the first vertebra. And I reward that. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have any problem getting all that, that lateral mm -hmm. flexion is because I reward that good bend. Yeah. Um, the other thing is when we look at this, you can see, well, you can't see if we're here. We're going to move him. I know. Um, right there. The amount of space under the chin. A lot of people look at this and go, Ah, I want more space, it'll be better for the horse. He'll be happier to be more comfortable. Actually, exactly the opposite is true. Um, I've got enough space here that I can put my fingers in here this way, which means that he can drink. I could give him a treat if I wanted to, if you use treats in your training. Mm -hmm. I could do all of those things. He can eat. He can part his mouth. He can part his teeth to swallow, unlike mm -hmm. the dressage horses that have their mouths clamped shut. Um, but if I have it loose, um, as it rotates up, there is that nerve that runs under here. Yeah. And if we hit that nerve, I'm going to see right here, as we play with this, and we go, yep, there it is. Yeah. Okay, there's the nerve. So if I play with this, yep, there's the nerve. If any of my bitless tools, like we talked about earlier, come yeah. up to here, for him it's going to be a big problem. He's sensitive on that nerve. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that if I've got to come all the way up to here to get that signal, then that means I'm going to be moving my arms. Mm -hmm. If I've got it adjusted here, all I have to do is pick up with my fingers here to get the same signal that other mm -hmm. people are using their whole yeah. arm to achieve. And it would roll easier too, wouldn't it? Like, yeah. yeah, it'll roll sideways. Again, yeah. if it's too long, you're gonna get that, un yeah. that, that uneven pressure and you're gonna get that tipping of the jaw. Yeah. So that's a lot of work. You know, it took me ages to try and get that 
so there's no daylight anywhere. Yeah, and it, it's I talk, I refer to it as you got to you got to train your hackamore. Yeah. And some people say, oh well, when you get the hackamore, it's already fitted. Well, it, no, you got to put it on the horse. Other people say, oh, you can just shape it by hand. Any good hackamore, you can't just shape it by hand. It's not going to stay. What happens is they when the braider braids these, these are wet. They have moisture in them. When they're finished braiding them, they let them dry. It's going to want to return to whatever shape it dried in. And if you shape it over time and you overshape it a little bit, yeah. then it will start to hold that shape. But it takes a few weeks to hold that, begin to hold that shape. So you wouldn't wet them and fit them wet? No, because the shape comes from the core. Right. So the core is what gives you not only the movement, the proper movement, but also the shape. Yeah. If you get enough moisture into the core to affect it, you've probably ruined the outside. All right. So you just dry shape it, it just takes time. Yeah. If you get in a hurry, it can be a problem. A bit like anything with horsemanship. Anything with good horsemanship yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should put that little caveat in there. Exactly, we? yeah. Good horsemanship. Um, and you can see like with this, as he's moving, this isn't gonna move. When I pick this up, it takes very little for him to get that mm. signal. And in fact, even in the, even in the Hackamore and Bozelle, I want, when people talk about a horse being light, I want this horse so light that all I have to do is pick up the hair on this Makate in order to get him to give. Okay, yeah. now that was only one hair, so I, yeah. but, but I want to be able to get him to give just from picking up the hair on the Makate. We have a lot of different definitions of light, but that that's getting pretty good, okay? A lot of people think, well, I've only got, mm. you know, I've only got five pounds or, you know, two and a half kilos and I'm light. No, uh-uh. We're talking about grams, not yeah. pounds or kilos. So you can mess this stage up pretty easily. Oh yeah, well you can mess any stage up pretty easily, but yeah. this one is, this is the crucial stage because this is where everything is made. Yeah. Um, but you don't have any sort of pain response with a hackamore compared to like a snaffle. That's the big difference is there is no pain response. This is where a lot of people get in trouble because what happens is that the horse starts getting heavy and just us as human beings, we. We're a tool using species. So when there's a problem, we want to use a tool to fix it. Or we blame the tool for the problem. Mm -hmm. Where actually, it, it wasn't the plane that crashed, it was the pilot that crashed the plane into the hill. Um, so when we're looking at this, it is um, more difficult. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more care in maintenance and fitting. And in our riding, it takes a lot more conscious effort in our riding. But I really, um, after working with hundreds of people and horses, I really, believe that if you ride in the hackamore in the long term you become a better rider sooner than if you had done the same thing in a snaffle because you have to think your way through yeah. the hackamore you can make it happen with the snaffle you have to think your way through it with the hackamore which then makes you mm. a better rider it's a different quality though i think anyway yeah the it softness is. is different and even the way the horses move are different um when you've been around this tradition a long time you start to be able to pick out those horses that are true hackamore horses mm -hmm. and those horses that were started in a snaffle. They even move differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was able to see it at the old California's event, the late Richard Caldwell. He yeah. rode in and I knew right away that he started his horses in a snaffle bit. Not saying that's a bad thing. It, for him, it was fine. It worked fine. Yeah. But the way the horse moved, he didn't move like a hackamore horse. Yeah. He moved differently. He moved like a snaffle bit horse. Um, there's a difference in the lift in the withers, there, in the chest. There's a difference in the, the freedom of movement in the stride. There is just a difference in overall carriage and relaxation because there's nothing restricting them. No. Um, and if this is fitted properly, it's like a comfortable pair of shoes. If, it's, if they're too loose, they're going to flop around and create a problem. If they're too tight, they're going to create a problem. But if they fit just right, you can wear it all day comfortably, no problem. Okay, so when he's in this, he's, he's a Hackamore horse. Basically. He's a Hackamore horse. Um, there's different stages with the Hackamore horse. Um, we could spend a lot of time going into all the different mm -hmm. signs and, you know, the Fiador, the rope that comes here, mm -hmm. or when do we keep this in our belt? When do we mm -hmm. tie it to the saddle? Um, all of those things. There's a lot of different little signals in the old California tradition that tells me where the horse is in their training. So if somebody shows up to, like, our family ranch where we run cows, mm -hmm. and they're in a setup like this, and they have their makate tied to the side of their saddle, I pretty much expect them to be able to do most of the stuff we're doing, and I don't worry about them getting bucked off in the morning. But if they've got this tucked up in their belt, and they've got an extra little string that ties down on the bottom and up over the pole, well, we're gonna keep an eye on them when we leave in the morning, because there's a good chance that horse may still try to buck him mm -hmm. off. And the point of that being in the belt is when you get bucked off, you can get a hold of it, 
so you don't walk home carrying your hackamore. Because the only thing more, embarrass more embarrassing than getting bucked off and walking home is having to carry your hackamore <laughs> on the way. Yeah. That's better than having it trashed, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you go straight from that to the two range? You from here, when I have, I have a list of things that I want my horse to do. Yeah. And it's, it, time doesn't matter. I just have the list. Mm -hmm. Some horses get through it at different rates. Once we've gotten through the list and they're doing everything I want that horse to do, soft, relaxed, mm -hmm. one-handed, then I start thinking about the, the two rein. Now for me, um, my list may be different than your list. Mm -hmm. It may be different than the people watching this, than yeah. their list. Because um, I need to be able to rope. I need to be able to lay, doc lay cows down mm -hmm. and doctor them alone and with a partner. Um, I want to be able to do all of the stuff you would see like in a typical rain working cow horse show. I want my horse to be able to survive when they're attacked by aggressive cattle because right now my family runs some cows that are yeah. have long horns and bad attitudes. Um, so I want my horse to be able to survive in the bullfighting ring. I also want my horse to be able to do what we would consider high school movements like mm -hmm. um, half pass, pee off. Yeah. Um, my horses do Spanish walk. We do all of um, canter pirouette. Yeah. We do all of those things and they are all trained in this tool right here. Exactly like okay. this. So you wouldn't go any smaller than that? you just go straight from that diameter? I would go to this diameter, I would do all the training, and then once it's good, then I would go smaller. And I would go smaller if I'm going to go to the bridle, but yeah. I would also go smaller even if I'm not going to the bridle for that extra refinement. So um, there's a gal in Germany, um, Izzy, that we mm -hmm. both know, yeah. that she's got a little mare that she doesn't ride in the bridle, but she rides in the small bull's hell because she's gone smaller and smaller for more refinement. Yeah. And it's a fabulous, fabulous choice. Okay. Yeah. So should we set him up in the two-rain? Yeah, let's go ahead and put a two-rain on yeah. him. Let's see what we get. And uh, can you get that from the other side? Yep. Are we still Stay running? Again. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Sorry, that'll be the outtakes. <laughs> So again, diff same diameter as the yeah. What we what we've got here is the same diameter rein as you have on the Bozell. In the two rein, it starts to become more and more important because um, now you're going to be handling more reins. So if you have the big Makate, then you're going to have a whole handful of stuff. Um, the other thing is we go down in size because I wouldn't want to try to put a bridle over this. It's going to interfere. It's going to bind up. We're going to have all kinds of hate and discontent between us and the horse because it's not going to be signaling things the way it should. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're all tied up and ready to rock and roll. So we'll just drop one and take the other. Um, I'll give you that. Oops, I took an arrow with us. Mm -hmm. So all of the fit and everything that we talked about with the other setup is exactly the same idea with this. It's just smaller. So we've got the same space under the jaw. Um, generally, if you have um, whatever size you have in your 5 eighths in your normal hackamore, you want to go down about an inch to half an inch, half an inch to an inch when you go to the smaller one because the reins are smaller, so this one does have an extra wrap, but we're okay for right now with the smaller one because we don't have the extra weight. So now we've got the small bozelle, and again, the fit's the same as the other one, everything touching the side of the face. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have... And then we have our bridle. Yeah, um, he's a little touchy with that, so... When we, um, when we look at these bridles also, um, a lot of times the horses will, over time, they'll begin to tell us a few things. Um, one of my mares, I had um, the, the bridle that I started her with was one almost identical to this. Mm -hmm. And then I'd gotten it. She was doing really good in it. She, she responded well. She was working good. And I got another one that was a little bit different mouthpiece, a little bit lighter. And she did really well on that. Just a little bit of improvement in the new mm -hmm. bit. Because the more I studied her mouth, I thought, well, let's try this. It might, she might like it better. And she did. And then I got a third one. And the third one not only, and she, she took them all good, not only did she take it, but the third one, when I would do this, she would reach for it. Right. She was like, yeah, I want that one. Um, now, he was a big problem with this, but then he had bad teeth, you know, and that was causing yeah. a big issue. Yeah. And you can see here, he's, he takes it fine. Yeah. Not a problem. Um, and that's what I was waiting for. That cricket, that rolling. Um, I want that cricket rolling, 
when they're standing relaxed. Yeah. Um, so that's a good sign. It's a very good sign. Well, when you think about it, what's one of the signs of relaxation in a horse? Licking and chewing. Yeah. So they're basically licking and chewing with a bit in their mouth, but they got a little toy to play with in the middle of it. Some, and, peop some people think that's just nervousness. No, um, you can. There have been some horses that I have heard that when you can hear the difference. It's like yeah. a, a, a different sound when it is a nervousness. Steve, can you hand me that half breed? When we're yep. talking about the, the cricket, what I'm talking about is this little roller right here in the middle. And this is a crucial piece that is missing on almost every modern Western bridle. And it's really a shame that they've lost it because this really helps facilitate relaxation through the jaw and the pole. It does a couple of other things. The tongue plays with that and the tongue being a muscle. Um, the more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Mm -hmm. So what that means is as they play with this, they are exercising that muscle so that when they do need to pick that bit up to work, they can hold it longer, more comfortably because they're stronger through mm -hmm. their tongue. And the other thing that it does is as they play with that cricket and their tongue is moving, it helps to make sure that the hyoid is not off-centered or locked or catching. It freely moves that hyoid apparatus, which is a really critical part of the horse in terms of their mouth and their infrastructure and their, their mouth and, and all of the muscle structure that works together with mm -hmm. that which is a whole, we could spend a whole session just yeah. on that, just on that one part of the mouth. Um, but this helps with that whole overall relaxation. All right. So and you, then... So you've got that curb done up the way you yeah, I've talked got, in the last video. I've got the curb is fairly tight. Now, I could go one less if I wanted to and still be okay, but I wouldn't go any less than that. So I can get one finger in there. Mm -hmm. it, basically, it's the same adjustment as I have on my hackamore. I can put one finger in there comfortably. Mm -hmm. That's enough. I could go a little tighter. Um, so if we like say the first time we put a bridle on this horse and I want to make sure that he doesn't accidentally bang himself in the mouth or something, yeah. I'll put it a little tighter so that thing doesn't flop around in there. But uh -huh. he doesn't need it tight. Okay? Yeah. Now when we hook up our reins, the reins for me are um, most these are kangaroo, which we're in Australia, so it's not surprising. <laughs> um, mine are all rawhide. It doesn't matter. Um, I just, I don't use um, nylon again. Um, but one of the things that's critical is this little piece right here that connects the reins to the bit. You can see this is a piece of, of just latigo leather. And this is cut where it's pretty thin right here. And that's on purpose. I want a spot somewhere in my reins where it will break. And that's for safety for the horse. If a cow gets a horn stuck in here, I want this to break. Mm -hmm. If we're turning cows on the fence and we're shipping cows and we're, you know, got, we're turning cows back and that kind of stuff, and we get it caught on a fence post or a, a rail, yeah. I want that to break. So this is a safety feature more than anything. Um, now, some people have looked at mine because mine are so worn and so thin. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh my God, if you put any pressure on that at all, it's gonna break. And I said, well, if it breaks, I didn't have a bridle horse. Mm -hmm. So that's going back to that whole thing with the string and the hair and all mm -hmm. of that that we talked about before. And you always put your reins on last like that? Yeah, I always yeah. put my reins on last um, and everything else is set and then my reins go on. Yeah. And hang that over the horn. And now one of the things I don't do is I don't lead my horse by the reins. We've got this, we've got this whole setup so we can lead from this. When I do lead, I take it through here so we're not putting pressure on the reins. Mm -hmm. um, if I need to, if I'm gonna lead this horse from the back of another horse, then I would tie this up around the throat latch so we're not pulling down here. Yeah. Um, if I have gotten into the stage where we no longer need this Bozell, well, one, I'm probably not really needing to lead him anyway. He's probably mm -hmm. just staying with me. But if I do need to, um, come here, buddy. If I do need to, all I have to do is bring these reins up by up around his pole here, grab a hold of him here, and I lead him with this. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what I'm in. If I grab somebody else's horse that's in a snaffle bit, I'll lead him the same way. Anybody's horse that doesn't matter what they're in, I'm not going to lead them by this bit because that's going to create problems in terms of our sensitivity in the mouth. False mm -hmm. signals again. I want to avoid anything that gives false signals. Okay? Yeah. Now you've got four reins to deal with, plus 60, 70 foot of rope when you're roping cows. Mm -hmm. So it does take a little bit of extra care 
to learn how to use all of this stuff. But once you do, you're able to give signals that are very um, precise. So I'm actually going to move him over just a little bit for the camera. Come on, buddy. There you go. Mm -hmm. So here, when I've got a hold of these reins, I want to be able to touch any rein I choose. I want to be able to touch the left makate, left bridle. Right makate, right bridle. Right bridle, that's left. Mm -hmm. Left bridle, right <laughs> bridle. Left makate, right makate. Yeah. I can touch each one of these reins independently and give exactly the signal I want if I'm holding yeah. them correctly and I've learned to use them right. I don't do this stuff. No. Like, neck. this is not neck reining. That's for freaking video games. That's, yeah. yeah. Mm -mm. We'll play video of that when we get riding. Yeah, when we get on, get horseback, we'll take good. a look at that, those signals. So that would probably never be in your belt because at this stage, it, the only time, it in your belt. Yeah, the only time I put this in my belt at this stage is that if I need to take it with me when I'm doctoring cows because I need to send the mm -hmm. horse back a little bit, and we're doing a lot of cows. So we're just doing one after the other, yeah. after the other, after the other. But 99% of the time, this is tied to the side of my saddle. One other quick thing, we want to make sure that this has room to work in here. So these, what we call the ears, right here on the bit, yeah. are curved out. out yeah. When you look at a lot of the, like the pelums and stuff, they aren't. No. The California bits are curved out for that reason, so that that Roselle can work in there freely. Okay. Right? So once he's through this and he's a bridle horse, how would we dress him then? Um, once he is through this, there are two, there are a couple different um, traditions. Um, the way I was raised is that you just take, you take the whole thing off. But there's an in-between stage. Mm -hmm. That in-between stage is he's working good, he's straight up in the bridle, and he's probably going to be okay. Yeah. Probably. Um, but maybe we're not really 100%. So there might come a time or a situation where we might need to throw a set of reins on this. So if that's the case, then what we would do is we would take this and we would leave this bozelle on, mm -hmm. but we would take the reins off. Now, some of the other traditions, like with the Buckaroos and the Great Basin, their tradition is they leave the bozelle on the whole time. Um, yeah. And the Buckaroo tradition is different than the old Vaquero tradition. And that sometimes gets me in trouble for saying it, but I grew up yeah. on the central coast of California and the tradition is very different than when I lived in Nevada outside of about an hour out of Reno. So now what we would do is we would have something like this, and then we would have our makate um, that would just be run up through, maybe there's a number of ways to do this, but one of them is just to run it up through here. Uh -huh. We tie that same bowline knot here, and now we have our lead for our horse, and we would just take this, and now we can use this yep. exactly like I just did. And then we just take that, tie that to the side of the saddle. Okay. Right. And now if things are going to get fast, if we start to have a problem, I can stop real quick, tie on a set of reins and I'm back in the two rein again. So if you're that situation, you want something that's usable, not exactly. something that's just pretty. Once I don't need this anymore, once I'm at the stage where I know I don't need to go back to the two rein at all, I take it off. Mm -hmm. And the reason I take it off is that shows respect for the horse and tells everybody else around he doesn't ever need one of these again. So it's almost a, a, a badge of honor that we take it off. Which is the opposite of what some people think. Exactly. Right? They say it has to stay on for the same no, reasons. It shows he's past that. It shows that he's graduated. It's like mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it's, it's, the, it's that diploma that yeah. hangs on the wall. Um, the other thing really quickly too, the brow band head stall. You guys see Steve's got a brow band head stall here. Mm -hmm. I was taught that you never ride a spade bit with a single ear or a split ear. Right. Because it can tip right uh -huh. or left. And then it tips in the mouth. Yes. Yeah. Here, this brow band head stall stays centered. And we want these conchos tight. Like this, the, that concho doesn't freely slide up and down and it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. It's tight because that helps lock everything right in the center and keep that from tilting. Right. Okay. So when this comes out, I've got another rope here, which we didn't talk about, which was, you know, now I, this, I haven't had a horse yet that I could put that on. Yeah. Once we, for me, with when I look at this, once we're past pretty much all of this, and I don't even need the bozelle anymore, but I might need something to lead him with mm -hmm. or whatnot, then I might take this fancy little rope 
And there's a number of ways to do this, but one of the things that I might do is I might tie a single Alamar. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da, my brain, there we go. So I might just tie this single Alamar knot around his neck here. And this Alamar knot is kind of like this um, pretty little flower here that hangs over his chest. Mm -hmm. And there's two kinds. There's a double, which would take too long to tie yeah. um, for the sake of our video right now. But this single, I might take this single Alamar, get all the twists out of my rope here, and then tie it here, and he'll pack that mm -hmm. around. And then if I need something to lead him with, I just untie it, tie it around his throat latch, and away we go. All right? All right. Um, and that would be the last stage. At that point, he would have none of the yeah. bozelle or this on him. He'd just have the bridle and that Alamar hanging around his neck. With the double Alamar, that's the final, um, that's the final stage. And that double Alamar, so the knot is the same knot, but it's, um, it's fancier. Yeah. And it takes a little longer to tie. And that is like the final doctorate diploma hanging on the wall. Um, so you'd but, be judged as soon as you walked in like that, you've been judged. Yeah, you better have, a, if you got one of those, if you've got this, just this on your horse, he better be good. He yeah. better be real good. Um, and the final stage of a test for the true bridal horse is can I ride him with just this around his neck and have him stay in collection, stay in self-carriage and work all day. And this is totally different than a neck rope. Some people go, yeah, it's a neck rope. Of course my horse can do that. No, this pretty little flower that you guys see right here mm -hmm. with that knot, you can't pull it like a neck rope because as soon as you pull it, that flower just becomes a wadded up knot. So you're not allowed to change the knot? Uh-uh, can't change the knot. So when you do this and you use this as that test, he should be responding 98% from your body and your leg and just the touch on the side of the neck from that rope. Otherwise the knot does this and nope, he's not there yet. So this is where the, I guess the modern natural horsemanship can you ride without a bridle really came from. Yeah, that's where it came from. And the problem is that it was never intended to be anything other than just a test. Yeah. You might brand calves like that in the morning, but then you put your bridle back on because if you do it for very long, the horse falls apart. Yeah. Um, you lose your collection and without collection, then you lose the athletic movement of your horse and you start cutting into their, their overall health and longevity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do have an obligation, don't we, if you're going to ride them, to absolutely get them fit and healthy enough Absolutely. To carry us. Yeah. Yep. Well, that was fantastic, Jeff. Thank you very cool. much for that.